I am Kathleen Epp. I am the keeper of the Hudson's Bay Company archives here at the Archives of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Manitoba. So that means I am the manager of the Hudson's Bay Company archives. Uh, we have the records of the Hudson's Bay Company since it began in 1670. I think that others wanted the archives. <laughs> Certainly Ottawa would have liked to have had them, but the Hudson's Bay Company's head office was actually in Winnipeg at the time that the archives were moved from London to Canada. So that was in 1973. Um, and so it made sense for the archives to be here. Of course, the head office didn't stay, but the archives did. Well, when I think about the point blanket, I do think of uh, the records at the archives and certainly in preparation for this, um, we felt like, you know, everywhere we looked, there's uh, representations of or mentions of blankets in the records of the Hudson's Bay Company. So we know that the, the theme of the blanket um, runs throughout the company's history. Um, we also know that we get a lot of questions about blankets uh, from our researchers, from people who visit the archives. Uh, we get a variety of questions. Um, people doing uh, textile history, wanting to know about the history of blanket making and English blanket making uh, specifically. Um, people uh, researching the fur trade and indigenous history and wanting un to understand uh, the role of the blanket in that history as a trade good, but also um, as a symbol. Many people contact us for photographs uh, and film footage that we have, historic photographs of course, for use in publications and films and exhibits. So we have lots of people with lots of questions about, uh, about the blanket and its history. I think about what those stripes represent and uh, sometimes I think I know and then I think, well, I don't know. What I do is I watch and I listen and I'm so curious as to what that blanket means to others uh, and what it means for people to access images of those blankets or the history of that blanket. Um, I think sometimes, you know, it really ranges from nostalgia, um, you know, a sort of romanticization of the blanket and its role in Canadian history to that symbol of colonialism that doesn't feel so positive and that it has real negative connotations for people and so you know as as an archivist and as a person who facilitates access to that history and those records um, we want to allow for all of those uh, interpretations uh, we don't we don't tell people what to think uh, we want people to see those records and read them for themselves and and sort of determine um, how, what that history history means to them and how to read those documents for themselves a lot of the photographs that we've pulled are sort of promotional photographs or staged photographs that the company would have uh, taken um, for use in promotions. Of course, like in 1920 and following that, they really shifted in terms of how they represented that blanket and how they marketed heritage in a way that they hadn't before that time. Heritage became something to market and so the image of the blanket became really important in, in sort of their representation of, of history. Uh, so a lot of the photos represent uh, that kind of promotional uh, bent, but other things are just, other photos are documented different events in history, different uses of the blanket. Uh, we've got photos that show the blankets used as sails. We've got uh, photos of the blankets uh, being incorporated obviously into Olympic uniforms in the 60s and, and other things like that. Um, the other records that I've pulled uh, date back quite a bit further and show sort of the first mentions of blankets in the Hudson's Bay Company records, so dating back to 1681 I believe documenting the the switch to ordering point blankets in 1779 and then in 1798 the first mention of the multi-stripe blanket. It's pretty neat uh, to be able to sort of um, touch these records that really date so far back and represent so much. Um, what's amazing to me is uh, you know these records weren't they were created for business purposes, right? And it's obviously been a very successful company and these records helped them to achieve that success. Um, but they had no clue uh, what people would be asking of those records uh, 350 years later, right? What would the questions be that people would come to these records for? What would these records show that they weren't, they weren't thinking about what they were documenting in that way and how people would use them 
all those years later. So uh, it's pretty incredible to think of what people can find in the records. I think we always want people to know that the archives are here, that the archives are open, and that we um, are dedicated to promoting access to the records for anyone who wants to have a look at them. Uh, obviously, people can come visit us in Winnipeg. We've got lots of uh, images, photographs, records online on our website as well, and we're always um, available to help people find the records that they want to look at. Uh, so that's really important for us. We, uh, we have the archives here. We sometimes could almost take them for granted because we can see them every day, but, but we don't own them and they are a publicly available resource and that's really important. These of course are all original records. So when I say it's 1681, that's when it was created. So this volume right here is from 1681 and the governor and committee of the Hudson's Bay Company, the decision makers in London, uh, wrote here that they were um, writing to France for, to send some samples of blankets to the Hudson's Bay. So that's the first mention, that's February 1681. Then we move over here, and this is this is a, a volume, but with pieces of paper that were glued together, and and now we've folded them out. And so this is from Churchill. So there was a post at Churchill um, in Manitoba, now Manitoba, and this is 1717. And what it shows is all of the goods that they had at Churchill for trading that year, and then uh, what the value of those goods were in terms of beaver pelts. So if we follow the line all the way down, uh, we find blankets right here. And it says that they had 168 blankets and that was worth 1,176 beaver pelts, uh, which means that one blanket would be worth seven beaver pelts. So if you needed a blanket, that's how many beaver pelts you needed to bring. The only thing uh, more uh, costly in a sense than the, than the blankets at this point were the guns and those were 13 beaver pelts each. Now, if you wanted to get a looking glass, of course, one beaver pelt, one looking glass, one ivory comb, one beaver pelt. So that just gives you a, a good sense of uh, the types of things that might be traded for, but also just really the value of a blanket at that time. It was a prized good. Uh, then we move over here, and these are two correspondent correspondence books and the correspondence is with Mr. Thomas Empson who was a blanket maker in England. So the first one here is from 1779, December of 1779 and it is the first time that they ordered blankets with the points on them. So uh, if we look at it here uh, it says the whole quantity will be 500 pieces of blankets that is of one point, one and a half point, two point, two and a half point and three point, 100 pairs of blankets of each sort. So the blankets, uh, the points on the blankets told them how big that blanket was and it became sort of another marker of the good that you were trading for and of course a different, a smaller blanket would be worth fewer beaver pelts and a larger blanket worth, worth more. Uh, so that was a big deal in 1779 and really changed the look of the blankets. And then this one is from 1798, uh, January 1798. Again, a letter to Mr. Thomas Empson. And I really love this one because this is the first mention we have of the multi-stripe blanket. And you might think while this became the iconic symbol of the Hudson's Bay Company, they might have done a lot of thinking about what those colors meant and how they would do that. So to me, it seems like a pretty casual mention and then it became what it became. So what it says here uh, for their order, 30 pairs of blankets of three points to be striped with four colors, red, blue, green, yellow, according to your judgment. So this is a collection of letters, uh, a selection of them that were sent to the company to uh, express people's experiences with the Hudson's Bay Company blanket. So this one was from Calgary, Alberta in 1934. And he writes, Dear Sirs, I have been sleeping outdoors all summer in the Canadian Rockies with a large ply HB Co. blanket. This blanket kept me warm in temperatures below freezing and also in frequent snowstorms. Nothing was used for sleeping except your large blankets by me and my five companions all summer. And not one night did we suffer from cold because of your company warm blankets. I would be glad to write an account of our trip in your magazine, The Beaver, and advertise your blankets to the fullest extent. Thank you for reading this letter. Albert G. McCall. This one from Port Arthur, Ontario, 1935. Dear Sirs, 
I am sending by parcel post a relic of a Hudson Bay Company blanket and think you will be interested in, with the history of it. This piece of blanket was taken from the bottom of Lake Superior from the wreck of the Algoma in 1886 near Isle Royal. My father, Mr. H. Valentine, who was a diver on the wreck, was taking out the machinery which was shipped to Owen Sound. He found the blankets tied in a bale and you will see on the edge the rest from the boat, also the points. They have been used in they have been in use for over 45 years by his family and his children's family. Hoping this information will be of interest to you and your famous blankets, Mrs. L. Maloney. I'll do one more. Uh, this one actually from Winnipeg. Dear sir, when washing my blankets the other day, the thought occurred to me that it would probably interest you to know that one of your bay blankets, which was purchased in December 1893 and was in constant use up till now, is still being used at a present. If you wish to see it, call to see me. Yours truly, Mrs. Henry Graff. That was 1935. 